We come together as a community like this. We join with a church that spans history and today the entire globe. And the truth is, is that the church has always been a collection of differences, a gathering of disparate voices blending to find harmony, a household of faith marked by all kinds of beautiful internal diversity. And today we bring our voices and our bodies and our stories into step with that tapestry your experience bumping up against mine and so many others. All of us drawn into work, worship, and advocacy as signs of renewal and flourishing. And this is flourishing that finds its source in what we share and what we hold in common, which is why as part of our liturgy today, I want to invite us to say the Apostles' Creed together with its words that don't negate our differences, or downplay the uniqueness of your unique experience of faith, but rather words that center our hope and our experience in an expansive community of grace. The words will be on the screen. I invite you to join me now. We believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Jesus descended to the dead, and on the third day rose again. Christ, our Savior, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the loving God and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today, we want to talk about turning points, you no know, turning back, getting out of boats, and moving forward. But to get there, we have to go back to where we were last week on the side of a hill with a hungry crowd, desperate for a champion, and to Jesus, who sneaks out the back door. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain 
by himself. That's what we read last week. Next verse, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. You're a disciple of Jesus. You've been following him around, listening to him teach. A while back, he scored you an invite to a great big wedding party. And you saw him turn gallons of water into an abundance of wine. And you thought, okay, there is something going on here. This is more than just a smooth talker. This guy is something special. And then you were there when a royal official came and asked about his son. And Jesus not only had the audacity to send the man away empty-handed. I mean, who speaks to a representative of Herod Antipas that way? But then he actually healed the child as well. Compassion and dignity in a way you've never seen demonstrated together. There was the pool of Bethesda where Jesus showed up the Roman healing gods. And then there was that meal today. I mean, that happened, right? Thousands of people fed with a few scraps. You can't explain it, but you were there. You saw it. Surely this man was the Messiah. It wasn't just you. Everyone realized it. The energy was palpable. It was all going to happen, and then it didn't. He just left. And not only that, he didn't come back. And not only that, now you're stuck in a boat that's about to capsize, and there's no way back to shore. Except here comes Jesus walking on water. I think this moment here in the middle of the lake is meant to address the fear of them losing what they had expected from Jesus. Think about this from their perspective. I mean, if he's not going to be king, what's the point of all this? What are we doing? If he's not willing to assume power, what can he possibly accomplish in the world? What's the point? If he's not ready to step up and take charge, even when a crowd of people are at a fevered pitch ready to act on his word, is he really worth following at all? Should we just go home? Is this really the one that we've been waiting for? And it's at that moment, at the point of no return, when Jesus appears and says, I am. And I know it's scary to believe in something you didn't see coming, but please don't stop now. We're just getting started. See, the whole point of the Easter story, the aim of these signs in John that move us toward Easter, it's not just that God wins. It's that Jesus transforms our imagination of what it means to be victorious. The power and force and coercion will give way to kindness and grace and welcome. That violence will be undone by sacrifice. That domination will be upended by self-giving. And sometimes the scariest part of believing in Jesus is actually trusting yourself to the way of Jesus. Believing not only that Jesus is Lord, but that his path through the world is the one that is worth taking. And so in whatever moments you find yourself at that point of no return, wondering if it's all worth it and contemplating turning back toward paths that are more familiar or easier, My prayer is that Jesus meet you and reassure you and encourage you not to stop, but to keep going, to find the way of peace and to actually walk it. Because as hard as it is to believe at times, the way to the kingdom of God is always through God's self-giving love. 